My family has owned a jewelry store here in New Orleans since 1952. My grandfather opened it up after spending most of his life working on a farm outside of Baton Rouge, having saved up for years to be able to afford the lease. He haggled with pawn shops and thrift stores, building up a fine collection of chains, brooches, and rings that he could turn a profit on. He built that business from the ground up, transforming it from a struggling, run-down old dump into one of New Orleans' most successful jewelry stores. When he retired, he handed the thing off to my dad, who he trained up throughout his teenage years and early 20s. Then when my turn came, the tradition continued. I learned how to evaluate gold and silver, checking for purity and such like, while other kids were finishing high school and going off to college, I was learning the jeweler trade. More than 50 years of hard work got poured into that place, three generations of Louisiana blood, and we were all extremely proud of it. But over the course of about 48 hours in August 2005, we almost lost everything when Hurricane Katrina hit the city. And, as it turned out, the actual hurricane was the least of our worries. Fortunately for my family, the suburb of New Orleans that we lived in at the time was just above the waterline, so we didn't get much in the way of flooding out where we lived. Sure, the winds and the rain were pretty scary, but I didn't start to really worry until I heard about all the looting going on downtown and how there was absolutely nothing in the way of law enforcement. I couldn't just sit there and watch it happen on the news, so I got in my car and headed towards downtown with my pistol in the passenger seat. When I reached the area where the water started to accumulate, I parked up my car, got out, and began to slosh through the flood water towards the street my store is on. It was horrible seeing the city I was raised in having been so utterly destroyed and it didn't take long before I started to see evidence of the looting. I saw a guy with about 10 pairs of jeans slung over his shoulder, wading through the water about 100 meters or so ahead of me. I didn't say a thing, not because I wasn't outraged, but because he held a small revolver up high just letting everyone know that he wasn't about to be stopped. I reached my store and thanked God that it hadn't been broken into but the inside was almost totally wrecked. I set about collecting up every valuable item that I could, intended to take it all up into the safe of the second floor where hopefully it would be safe from any looters that came by. But right as I was in the middle of doing so, I heard the sound of a boat engine just outside, along with a bunch of angry sounding voices. As soon as I turned around, I saw a masked man pointing a rifle at me through the wrought iron gating that I used to lock up my store. He screamed at me to drop the pistol, barking at me that he'd shoot me dead if I didn't comply. I knew if I did, that'd be the end of my store, but he started counting down from five like he was going to pull the trigger when he got to zero. So I did. I dropped my gun into the water and watched as what appeared to be a well-organized team of looters wrenched open the old iron gates and a crowbar and proceeded to break into my store. They were well-armed, well-equipped, and all of them had body armor on too like they'd seen the destruction and the chaos and just decided to take full advantage of it all. It terrified me that predators like that seemed to walk among us. One had a pistol to my head as the rest commenced to smashing the glass cabinets and emptying the contents in the plastic bags. I had to watch while they pretty much emptied the entire store, but even when they'd taken almost everything, they weren't satisfied. The guy with a pistol in my head started demanding I tell him where the rest was, that he knew I had a bunch more jewelry stashed away somewhere, along with some cash. He was right, but I lied and told him they emptied me out. That's when he started dunking my head under the water for longer and longer periods of time, telling me he'd sooner drown me than walk away at that point. It was pure torture. I felt like I was going to black out, so in the end, I just told him about the safe upstairs. They dragged me onto the second floor and held that gun to my head as they made me unlock the safe, then emptied the entire thing into plastic bags that they were carrying. Almost five grand worth of cash and jewels were gone, just like that. Then as quickly as they had arrived, they left, having completely emptied me out. I'd gone downtown to protect my store, and I'd failed, miserably. It was one of the most terrifying, humiliating experiences of my life, but I'm glad I was able to walk away with my life. It took a while before the store was up and running again. I had a fight with insurance companies who seemed unwilling to pay out, some claiming an act of God or some other nonsense. But in the end, we didn't lose the store entirely and were open for business again. Although there's not a day that goes by that I don't see that guy's face, 
I remember how that flood water tasted when that evil SOB almost drowned me in my own store. For the longest time now, my one true passion in life has been fishing. I have a really high pressure job as a stock trader in my hometown of Philadelphia, and nothing seems to help me unwind from a stressful week quite like a day's worth of fishing. I think it's the combination of the serene setting, the slow, steady pace of it, and the fact that I'm reconnecting with nature. When most of my life is spent in a stuffy office space staring at a computer screen, but there's always been one dream fishing trip that I've always wanted to go on but never really had the time to arrange, and that's bow fishing down in Louisiana. Ever since I saw a segment on it on the World Fishing Network, I was just dying to try it. I always wanted to try out some kind of archery too, so combining that with my passion for fishing just seemed like the obvious choice. I had mentioned it once or twice to the wife, and being the great listener that she is, she ended up arranging a trip down into the bayou for myself and a few of my buddies for my 37th birthday. We flew down to New Orleans on that Friday morning, which I had no idea was named after Louis Armstrong, then spent the day hanging around Bourbon Street drinking cocktails and soaking up the jazz. Then after fighting the hangovers the next day, we drove down along the Mississippi River to this little place called Burris, where we found ourselves at Nola Bow Fishing Charters. The guys down there were awesome, sharing all their little tricks and techniques with us to ensure we'd have as lucrative a trip as possible. Then, once the sun had set, we loaded up into the boat and set off into the swamps. It really was like a dream come true to me. The landscape down there really is something to behold, but here's the thing. The shallow bottom boat we were on had these floodlights on them, just below the waterline. Most fishermen will tell you that this is basically cheating since the fish tend to be attracted to the lights like that at nighttime. But since we were using bows and arrows, I guess it kind of evened out the odds. However, having lights on your boat like that totally ruins your night vision, so as much as you can see the waters around you perfectly clearly, it blinds you to the darkened areas beyond, and that makes you feel pretty vulnerable indeed. There could have been anything out there in the darkness just watching us and we'd have absolutely no idea it was there. So we're eventually having a ball for the first hour or so, mostly just making fun of each other for missing our shots so much, but eventually we actually started getting the hang of the whole accuracy thing. We're pulling in all kinds of black drums, redfish, and flounder, which are absolutely delicious by the way, but I couldn't see any of the one fish I wanted to shoot, and that was an alligator gar. I'd had my heart set on getting my hands on a big 10-footer to show the guys back at the office, and I was worried the entire trip might pass before I got a chance to shoot one. But eventually one of my buddies is looking over the side of the boat, into the brightly lit but murky waters, when, when he calls out to me that he sees this big old gar hiding among some reeds just a few feet away. He knew I was after one, as was everyone, so everyone got out of the birthday boy's way so I could get a clear shot on it. So there I was, right up on the edge of the boat with my bow and arrow in hand, trying to steady myself to get a good aim on this gar. God, this thing was huge. I mean, it was easily a ten-footer. The same exact kind of monster that I've been dreaming of getting my hands on, and I really had to regulate my breathing to keep my hands from shaking too much. Only just as I start to get ready to aim on the thing, and I'm about to fire the arrow in the water, it starts to slowly creep further away from the boat, almost like the thing knew I had my eyes on it. But I wasn't about to let it get away, and as dumb as this was, I started leaning over the edge of the boat so not to lose it. That's when I lost my balance. I started wobbling, tipping over the side of the boat before my buddies could reach out to grab me and reel me in. Bow in hand, I crashed into the murky waters head first, getting absolutely soaked in the process. I can hear the guys in the boat laughing before I can even resurface, and when I finally do, I gotta admit, I was laughing too. But as I look up from the water, they don't look so cheerful anymore. They're all just looking behind me, staring at something with these looks of terror on their faces. I'm all like, what? What's the problem? Before I look behind me, seeing this pair of glassy eyes glowing in the lights of the boat just before they disappear under the water. 
It was a gator, and it was huge. I start scrambling to get back on the boat, trying and failing to scale the side of it before the thing got me. All my buddies rush to the side to try and grab me, but the bow fishing instructor rushes to the opposite side, grabbing one of two of my friends and imploring them to do the same. At least we tip the whole thing over and all end up in the water. Just as they get a grip on me and start dragging me upwards, I feel like intense pressure on my right boot. It was horrible. I just started screaming that it's got me. It's got me over and over, feeling my leg beginning to stretch from the guys dragging me up and the gator trying to drag me down. Then suddenly, I'm free, and the guys are able to pull me back up into the boat. But that didn't bring me any relief, as in the moment, all I can think is how the gator had bitten my foot off. There was no pain, but I've heard in those adrenaline-fueled moments you don't feel the massive injury that's been inflicted on you. I'm scrambling around the boat, trying to get a look at my leg, half expecting to see a missing foot and blood pouring out the bottom of the boat. But to my instant relief, all I see is a soaking wet sock covering my still-attached foot. The relief, the pure relief I felt in that moment I can hardly put into words, and it didn't take me all that long to figure out that a hangover had basically saved my life. Since I was feeling so rough that morning, I hadn't bothered to tie my boots up all that tight, giving them enough slack to allow the gator to straight up pull it off my foot. It was without a doubt the single most terrifying moment of my entire life. Seeing that thing's eyes practically glowing in the floodlights of the boat put the absolute fear of God into me, and I know how lucky I am that I was able to walk away from a situation with all my limbs still attached. I could just as easily bled to death lying on the floor of that boat, thousands of miles away from my wife and kids while my buddies looked on helplessly. We took a fair amount out of the swamps that night, and I suppose it was only right that the swamps took something back. I didn't manage to catch the gar that I'd been lusting after in the end, but that was okay by me, I guess. I'm just quick to remind myself that there are real-life monsters out there, things that look like they're from a land before time, just watching and waiting for idiots like me to slip up, figuratively, or in my case, literally. Back when I was pursuing my PhD in zoology at the UL Lafayette, I chose to write my thesis on the life cycle of biology of the alligator snapping turtle. This meant I spent an awful lot of time out at the Atchafalaya National Wildlife Refuge, a one million and a half acre area of hardwood swamps, lakes, and bayous about 30 miles west of Baton Rouge. It's a truly beautiful and awe-inspiring place, but it's wild. One of those areas out in the country that has barely been conquered by humanity. And coming from Chicago, I'd never seen anything quite like it. But as much as I had come to love Atchafalaya, I had one of the worst experiences of my entire life whilst lost in the swamps there. An incident so intensely terrifying that I had to put my studies on pause for a matter of months in order to recover. I've decided to write down what I went through as a form of cognitive behavioral therapy and the hopes that it will help me deal with some of the unresolved traumas that followed me out of the swamps. Whether or not it will actually help, I can't tell just yet, but I sincerely hope it does, as frankly, I've been unable to be completely happy or content in myself since it happened. So without further ado, this is my story. It all started the morning my research partner and I were supposed to drive out to Achafalaya for a long day of study and observation. The weather had been absolutely abominable over the previous few weeks and we picked a time during what appeared to be a brief break in the rainy season. It might be the only period for weeks where it would be feasible to undertake such a research trip, but in the morning we were due to depart, I awoke to a text message saying he was feeling severely under the weather. He apologized but told me that he wouldn't be able to accompany me. I was disappointed in the extreme, but like I said, the following few days looked like they would be the only time I'd be able to get a sizable chunk of research completed. So as foolish as it was, I loaded up my gear into my car and drove out into the swamps, alone. I drove out to the small town of Plaquemine, just on the edge of Achafalaya, parking up near a small mom-and-pop joint to get some griots and grits before my hike into the swamps. 
I was in a pretty bad mood marching in there alone, and I had to carry a little extra equipment since I couldn't spread the load with my research partner. This made the walk out to my preferred observation spot much more tiring than usual. I mean, it's crazy how just a little extra weight can make a long hike like that seem harder. But anyway, I'm on my way out to a place called Upper Flat, a big stretch of water near Little Tensaw Bayou, when all of a sudden, I start realizing that I don't recognize any of the terrain. This was weird, as I'd made this journey like at least 50 times before, too many to really keep track of, but I figured I've only strayed just a little off course and I could find my way back onto my regular trail in no time. It was just a case of finding out which direction I'd move off in and making the appropriate course correction. Only when I get my compass out, I see the little needle spinning around wildly, like whirling around in a circle like it was being propelled by something. I give it a little tap, shaking it up, but it carries on doing exactly the same thing. It's not like it was a cheap compass either. It was a Sunto KB14 and there's some of the best compasses on the market. That one in particular sent me back almost 200 bucks, so I fall back on the compass on my iPhone, which is even less reliable but works off a of GPS as opposed to the Earth's natural magnetic forces. But again, not only does it refuse to calibrate, but I realize I have absolutely no bars on my phone either. That was definitely not normal. The cell reception isn't the best out there, but I always get something, even if it's just a single bar to send texts. I'm a little worried by that point, as I've basically got no method of reaching the outside world if something goes wrong. But it's either push on and get my day's research done, or walk back the way I came and face messing up my entire thesis and I don't even know if the way I came will even take me back to Plaquemine by that point. So, I foolishly decide it would be better to push on as opposed to turn back, one of the single biggest mistakes of my life. So I'm walking for like another hour or so, hopelessly lost in a place I somehow barely recognize when I begin to smell smoke coming through the trees. I figured it's some campers or hunters out there, which would be highly unusual for the wet season, but at least they'd be able to point me back in the direction of Upper Flat. I follow my nose as the smoky smell gets more and more intense, until I start to see the smoke itself wafting through the trees. That's also about the time I begin to hear the slow, rhythmic sounds of a banjo being plucked, just out of sight. It's not some jolly Cajun tune, either. The sounds are discordant, ominous even, and the hairs on the back of my neck begin to stand on end as... I finally begin to see this little wooden shack coming into view. I can see the campfire by that point, and the sounds of the banjo are floating out of a small window in the shack. I'm nervous, but I speak up anyway, calling out hello and asking if anyone is home, even though I knew well that there is. I was just trying to be polite, you know. This angry-looking face appears in the window in an instant, a face I'll never forget. This guy's skin looked like leather, all wrinkled and cracked while the darkest eyes I'd ever seen started around from sunken eye sockets. He had a beard and mustache, but it was all dark, ratty, patchy hair that made him look more like a kind of vermin than a man. There was some rustling from inside before the guy stumbled out from the shack's door, staring at me from the wooden steps. I apologized for my intrusion, then asked him if he knew which direction I could find Upper Flat. He didn't say a word at first, just carried on staring at me like I was somewhere I didn't belong, which I suppose was exactly the case. I then took to reassuring him that I didn't want to take up any of his time, that I was a little lost and all I wanted was to find my way back towards Little Tensa. Petit Tensa? He replied in a drawl of Cajun French. Uh, oui. Parlez-vous anglais? I had picked up a little French since moving to Louisiana for school, but I'm not about to pretend it was any good. The man just shook his head and then said something that sounded like a question that included the word traiteur. For those of you that don't know, in Louisiana, a traiteur is what they call someone who practices so-called faith healing, and whose primary method of treatment involves what's known on as kind of a laying on of hands, so to speak. An important part of Creole and Cajun folk religion, the Traiteur combines Catholic prayer, medicinal remedies, and occasionally voodoo rituals. 
or at least I thought they did. I genuinely didn't think that there were any traitors left, assuming the practice had long died out, yet apparently not. Uh, traitor cum, uh, voodoo, no? I asked with a chuckle in my terrible French, trying to be as disarming as possible as to not irritate the man any further. He didn't laugh. He didn't smile. He just got mad. Really, really mad. He started growling things in French I didn't understand, pointing at me accusatorily as he seemed to get angrier and angrier. I started to back off slowly at that point, hands raised in the air as if to say, I don't want any trouble. But somehow that just makes him even more irate. And then he's sort of apoplectic with rage as he pulls this huge gator jawbone knife from behind his back and starts pointing it directly at me. A knife on its own would have been intimidating enough, but seeing the blunted alligator teeth that made up the handle, Jesus, that's just about scare the life out of me. I thought once I was out of there I'd be okay, but as I'm walking back through the forest, pretty shaken up, he starts screaming in French and whistling. Only when I look over my shoulder just to make sure he's not about to give chase, I notice something that makes my blood run cold. He's not screaming at my back. He's not whistling at me either. He's screaming and whistling into the forest. It didn't quite hit me at first. I just peered over the back of my shoulder wondering what he was doing, but then I realized he was calling others, telling them there was an intruder or whatever. I tried to move as quickly as I could without running, don't get me wrong. I was absolutely terrified, but the bayou is not a place to go blindly sprinting among the greenery. Aside from gators and occasional cougar sightings, Louisiana is home to the cottonmouth snake. Although it's not outright deadly, their venom contains an anticoagulant, meaning the wound won't clot. Cottonmouth bites have been known to be fatal and without treatment certainly require amputation. So... I'm sort of jogging and bounding my way from the shack as fast as I can, keeping my eyes on the ground so I don't get myself bitten. I go for about 20 minutes or so until I'm happy I'm far enough away from that angry Cajun to resume my walking pace. I felt exhaustion setting in at that point too. I'm sweating through my clothes and I am completely and utterly lost. My compass and phone still aren't working at all and the further I walk, the more I'm panicking that I'm not going to be able to get out of the swamps by sundown in which case I would be really screwed. But just as I'm starting to feel relatively safe, I hear something like a twig snapping behind me before I get this horrible feeling in my gut like someone is actually following me. I do a quick 360, making sure I can't see anyone, which I don't. The bayou seemed as still and quiet as ever, yet the feeling didn't abate. I'm still convinced that someone is out there just beyond my vision, watching me with unseen eyes. I start moving more quickly again, bounding through the trees until I'm almost certain I can hear the sounds of a car driving in the distance. I was close to road, I was sure of it. But right as I start to move off in the direction of the sound, someone steps out from a tree just to the side of me. They were dressed in all black, bare-chested with red-brown skin that was riddled with strange-looking tattoos. Over their face was a mask that looked an awful lot like the front section of a human skull, and in their hand was a huge black blade of some kind. To this day, I have never seen anything as completely and utterly terrifying as whoever or whatever walked out from behind that tree. Whether or not they intended to do me harm or just scare me out of the area, I can't really say for certain. But I sure didn't want to wait to find out. I forgot about the cotton mouths and just ran as fast as I could, sprinting through the trees as I heard the guy following me. It was horrifying. I could hear him panting just a few meters behind me, the whole way until I burst through this thick patch of bushes and onto the highway behind it. I ran out in front of a car which almost smashed into me, honking its horn with the driver going crazy. I ran around to the guy's driver's window and begged him to let me in. At first he told me to screw off and almost drove off on me. But I begged the guy. I mean, I really begged. And I don't know if it was how haggard I looked or if it was the genuine terror in my voice, but eventually he agreed to let me in. I told him what went back down in that bayou and I asked him if he'd ever seen or heard anything like that. He told me no, 
but also mentioned that he knew way better than to be walking around the bayou on his own like that, and that I was an idiot for doing it. He was kind enough to drive me back over to Plaquemine to where my car was parked, and I thanked him profusely for potentially saving my life. I offered him some gas money, but he told me no, that there was no way he was about to take money off of me for just doing the right thing. That's something I never forgot about Louisiana, just how kind and generous people could be. How the whole thing about southern hospitality was very, very true. But I've also never forgotten about that man in the bone mask. The man who haunted my nightmares for months after, and almost ruined my whole time at college since, like I said, I had to put my studies on pause just to get over what I'd seen out there. So please, don't ever go walking into the bayous of Louisiana alone, because there are people out there that are seriously averse to the intrusion of outsiders. Hey y'all, my name is Troy and I live with my wife and daughter in the Gentilly neighborhood of New Orleans. Both me and my wife are Creole and we're really proud of that. We have a rich and diverse heritage that we can both trace back for generations. We was born, both raised in New Orleans, it's our home, and neither of us would rather live anywhere else in the world. But although this city is nicknamed the Big Easy, living here has been anything but. From the heat and humidity to the gators and hurricanes, I think the sense of community down here has been forged out of suffering. And back in 2005, when we was hit by Hurricane Katrina, boy did we suffer. So back in 2005, my family was living in this sturdy, red-brick, two-story here in Gentilly. I guess it's my fault that we went through what we did, because even after we got the hurricane warnings, it was my decision to keep us there. I mean, we had it for at least four or five years at that time, and never once had it flooded before. No matter how crazy the storms got. On top of that, the roof had an almost an inch of waterproof plywood underneath it, and... I laid all the shingle with my own two hands. I was proud of my work too, put a lot of time into it. Maybe it was my pride getting in the way, but I reckon we'd be alright. And at first, we were alright. My wife and I figured it was just another regular old hurricane, if you can call them that. But then we got the news that the levees had broke. And only then did we realize just what we was in for. The water came in fast, real fast. It flowed down the street we lived on like a river and leaked into our house wherever it could. We grabbed all kinds of things we didn't want to lose from the ground floor and then headed upstairs to safety. Somehow I got it into my head that it would just stop there, but I remember how scared my wife got as the water started climbing the stairs step by step. We watched them disappear one by one until, not long after, it was soaking into the carpet right there on the second floor. The house had never flooded before. Not even once. And then there we were, feeling like we had no more than an hour before the entire place would be underwater. Our daughter was real young at the time too, only just out of diapers, so you can imagine how scared we was and how her crying made everything so much more tense. That's when all the power went out. Me and my wife saw this big flash of light outside, along with hearing these scary sounding sparks from outside, but it wasn't lightning. It was from the transformer down the block as it shorted out and gave up. After that, we were in darkness. I was hauling as many of my valuables and essentials as I could into the attic of our house while my wife tried to keep the baby calm. She was hushing her, singing her little songs, but the baby was wailing something fierce. She knew something was badly wrong and she wasn't too proud to show it. By the time it was up to our waist on the second floor, we were all really starting to panic. But suddenly, it just sort of stopped. We wasn't sure it had at first, I just figured it had slowed down but was still rising. But sure enough, it had, and I swear I could have danced for joy. Sure, almost the house was ruined, but as long as the water stayed just there, we wouldn't drown, and to me, that was something worth celebrating. It was about midnight when this water stopped rising, and we were in total darkness, only able to see by flashlight. Our bedroom had a balcony on it, so I headed out there to get a look at the street outside. It was like a river out there, just all this rushing water flowing down the street, and it was filthy. 
It had this oily black layer on the surface and trash was everywhere. All kinds of things floated past me. Anything that could float out of people's houses was just bobbing on the surface. It was a vision of utter destruction. But I'll never forget the noises coming from other people's houses. There was all this banging sounds coming from the people's roofs, where they were trying to break out of their attics. It was haunting. Like all these houses had been turned into coffins, and the people inside had been buried alive. Just this horrible boom, boom, boom that echoed all around our neighborhood. And you couldn't tell exactly where it was coming from. The water seemed to create these echoes or something, sending the sounds every which way until it seemed like the entire city was all playing drums at the same time. I'll never forget what that sounded like. I told my wife to take the kid up into the attic to try and get some sleep, but I'm not sure she slept a wink that night. Around noon the next day, a boat full of guys wearing uniforms of some kind came along and hitched themselves to our balcony railings. I thought we were saved, that everything after that would be okay. They drove that boat all the way to a nearby overpass where they'd already ferried about half the neighborhood. I mean, there was about two or three hundred scared, exhausted people already there, just waiting around to be told about what to do next. But once we got there, we realized how bad the situation was. Nobody had no food with them, no water or bedding neither, but we all just guessed that someone would come along with supplies we needed. There was no way the government was just going to leave us there to die, right? It makes me angry just writing that, knowing what I do now. But they did. They just left us there to rot, like they straight up forgot about us. And that's when things started to get bad. I mean really, really bad. After one night up over on that overpass, the sense of community started to come apart pretty quick once people got into their heads that we'd just been abandoned. It got tribal, brutal even. People was going around taking food or money from those who wouldn't defend themselves properly. Those folks had no shame, didn't even bother to cover their faces or nothing like common bandits. They just felt entitled to other people's stuff. Not a hint of guilt about them. What little food or water the group had was all gone by that second night, and the next morning, people started trying to escape the overpass on whatever was floating by. I'm talking wheelbarrows, those little plastic swimming pools, anything that came by that looked like it might take them somewhere away from that overpass. People were getting real desperate by that point, and people were getting mean too. Luckily, I had the foresight to keep my cell phone dry and charged, so the whole time we'd been up on that overpass... I had been keeping in touch with a cousin of mine who lived uptown. Apparently he hadn't had any flooding at all, still had running water, still had power, the works. The only trouble was that the water was real deep at the end of the overpass. My wife wasn't a strong swimmer, and forget about the baby, so swimming was totally out of the question. We was trapped up there, stuck on that overpass as the group we were with became more and more fractured, aggressive and paranoid of each other. These mean folks were accusing people of hiding food or water. Fights was breaking out. Kids were crying. It was just awful. The third morning we was up there, something terrible happened. Some kid is messing around in the overpass railings, and I'm watching, wondering where this kid's parents are to stop him doing something so dumb. Then the kid just slips. People screamed and ran to the edge, and so did I. It must have been a 50 or 60 foot drop into the water. I mean... It was a long way. We were expecting this kid to resurface so we can tell him where to swim to, but no one comes up. He just disappears under the water and not a soul did anything to try and help. I only realized later that the water wasn't even all that deep. And the speed the kid fell, he would have smashed into the concrete under the water, maybe even head first from the way he fell. We watched a kid die that morning, and people were so hungry, thirsty, and tired... They, they almost acted like it didn't mean a thing. It was then that I decided that I had to get my family out of there before things got worse. And that's when I had an idea. You see, there was this guy on the other side of the overpass from us that had been sleeping on this inflatable pool lounger thing. The bandits in the group had tried to take it off of him at one point and he had fought them off, something fierce, but I figured if I had asked him real nice and told him about my baby that he might just give it to me so we could get out of there. I walked across the group to him, and he gives me this look like, 
leave me alone, but I start explaining about my kid, how she hasn't had no food or water in God knows how long, and that if she didn't get some soon, she might die. He looks like he doesn't believe me until I point across the overpass to where they were sitting. Then, the look on his face just softens, and he gives me that pool lounger without a word, just straight up gives it to me. So as discreetly as I can, as not to let the bandits see us leaving, I take my family down to the water's edge and put them on the pool lounger. I start wading out, and before long, I'm up to my neck in the filthy flood water. My wife and kid are whimpering and crying, wanting to go back to the overpass because they were so scared, but I told them that wasn't happening. That was getting to be a real bad scene up there and I wasn't going to be around when it imploded. After about two or three hours of pushing that pool lounger in the direction of uptown, I'm exhausted and our pace has slowed down a whole lot. All of a sudden I feel the lounger snag on something in the water. Now you gotta appreciate that because it was so dirty and oily neither me or my wife could really see what it was. Like I said, I was incredibly tired, so I asked my wife to try and move it out of the way, but when she does, the thing rolls over in the water, and we actually see what it is. It was a dead guy, this old dude who probably couldn't swim so good, and he looked absolutely horrifying. His eyes were all milky white, his mouth was wide open and full of water, and his face was all swollen and purple. I mean, he looked like a straight-up monster and my wife and kids started hollering up a storm on the lounger, begging me to get us out of there. I had to physically move this dead body out of the way of the lounger, grabbing onto the dead guy's arm and feeling it squish in my hand as I dragged him away. The smell off of the body was horrific, and I was gagging and retching while my wife was hysterical on the lounger. I had to yell for her to calm down, screaming at her to get her head straight. I never yell at my wife but I was just terrified she'd have a panic attack or something and fall off the lounger with our baby in her arms. But she does. For the sake of our baby, she starts breathing right, and about an hour or so later, the water starts shrinking a little, and we finally make it to my cousin's place. We stayed there for about a week, living off my cousin's generosity until we could finally get evacuated out to a FEMA camp out in North Carolina. It was real nice to us out there, but... I think a lot of folks just felt bad that we'd been left alone for so long. And I hate to get political about this, but the whole experience changed the way I think about the government. I get that no one expected Katrina to be that bad. I do. I was just as surprised as anyone that the levees broke after being so good for so long, but what are we paying taxes for if they ain't going to use it to help us when we need it? We pay them so they can look after us, not all the time, but... Sure, during an emergency like that. I don't think it was a racial thing like a lot of people try to make it out. Where we lived, and gently, there was all sorts of folks living there. Black folks, white folks, Latin folks, and we all got abandoned just like everybody else did. I just hope that we learned enough from that whole horrible experience to be able to deal with it better next time something like that happens. And I pray that we do. Because I'm not sure New Orleans could survive something like that again. As much as I love the place, Katrina showed me something. A community is fragile, and it don't take much for it to unravel. I live in a place called Crowley, Louisiana, not too far from the city of Lafayette. It's a pretty boring town, not much really happens here at all. Perhaps the most interesting thing that goes on is the yearly International Rice Festival, which should basically tell you all you need to know about the place. On April 2nd of this year, I was sitting out on the porch of my parents' house at about 9 in the evening, just chilling and scrolling through Twitter. It was a quiet night, the sun had just set, and aside from a little low-volume music playing out of a neighbor's window, it was a peaceful, serene, Louisiana night. But then I began to hear something in the near distance. A sound that was weirdly familiar to me. It was this blaring noise that got louder and louder the more I listened, until eventually it was so loud that people were coming out of their houses to check out what it was. It was a siren, this start-stop wailing siren sound that echoed all throughout our neighborhood, and although I couldn't quite work out where I'd heard it before, it was honestly one of the most ominous sounds I'd ever heard in my life. 
I was panicking over what it was about, so I called my dad onto the front porch to see if he knew what it was about. He didn't seem to take me all that seriously at first, and I'm pretty sure he was just as confused as why I found the sound of police sirens so alarming. But when he heard the sound, and recognized that it wasn't no regular police siren, he got this serious expression on his face and told me to get back in the house and go up to my room. I was already pretty freaked out, but when my phone starts buzzing with notifications from my friends, all asking if I could hear the siren sound in the streets, it was all over Crowley. That same horrible sound was blaring out all over our town, and none of my friends seemed to know why. Their parents were freaking out too. Some of them were asking if it was a bomb siren or something, and actually told them to go down into the basements just in case something horrible was about to happen. I heard my dad walking in the hallway upstairs and I peeked out to ask him if he had any idea what was going on and he had actually taken his gun out of the locker he kept it in. Now that really did freak me out. Seeing him panicking too was just the worst. Then I get a group text from a friend of a friend who texted a bunch of us letting us know that the siren that we were hearing was actually from that Purge movie. That's where I heard it before. There were some of us who actually really flipped at this point and said they knew the purge was actually going to happen one day, and tonight was the night it was going to happen. A few minutes after they started, the sirens died down, and although my dad kept watch downstairs with his gun, nothing terrible happened, thank God. Then the next day it was all over the local news that it was actually a siren that the cops had played from their bullhorn things to let everyone know that there was going to be a curfew in place. People were going crazy, asking why the cops had chosen to play a noise from a scary movie instead of just telling us that there were going to be a curfew in place. Apparently, they tried to let people know that there was going to be a curfew, but I sure didn't hear anything about it. But then to use the sound from that Purge movie, I mean, what were these idiots thinking? The chief of police ended up releasing a statement a few days later saying he had no idea that the sound was from a horror movie and made a full and frank apology to the people of Crowley. But, I mean, I felt kind of dumb having freaked out so much over nothing, but seriously, for a few minutes, the whole thing was absolutely terrifying. This right here is a true story, and it was in the news, so y'all can look it up if you don't believe me, but I'm telling you, every word is the truth. So I live here in Paulina, Louisiana, but part of my job takes me through Mississippi and into Nashville, Tennessee. I won't bore you with the details of my job, but because of all the traveling I do, I follow the Twitter account of the Tennessee Highway Patrol. It helps me stay up to date with all the news on accidents, road closures, anything that might make traveling slower or more difficult. If I get slow, I lose money. Simple as that. So I think it was back in September of 2016... Tennessee Highway Patrol's Twitter posted a tweet that really caught my attention. They issued a warning to local citizens, one that I actually had to read back twice because it sounded so crazy. I thought it might have been a joke, something from one of those parody accounts or whatever, but I double-checked the account itself and the whole thing seemed incredibly genuine, and that freaked me out double when I realized that they were for real. The tweet told people to keep their eyes out for people dressed in clown masks. And get this, because these sick idiots were looking to lure kids into the woods. The cops had their suspicions that these people were some kind of predators that were actually out there hoping to lay hands on kids or something. I mean, can you believe that? The actual highway patrol in Tennessee, but that out there. So you can understand why people went and took it seriously. So a few days later, it's Monday morning, and I'm doing some grocery shopping at the supermarket here in Paulina. I push my cart down an aisle towards the front doors, just minding my own business, and as I come out into the open, near the cash registers, I see these two guys by the front entrance. They were just standing there, not doing anything bad, but what they had on freaked me out. I swear I'll never forget what they were wearing. They were both wearing these black jumpsuits with little strips of reflective tape on them, one with bright orange gloves, the other with these bright yellow gloves on. The taller of the two had a clown mask on, this really creepy one with a bright orange wig on it. I'm serious, the face on that one was one of the most horrible things I'd ever laid eyes on in my whole life. 
this big old wide smile with jagged teeth and stuff. The other one had a clown mask on too, only his was all black and white with this big black clown nose on it. Both of them were just standing there, staring at people who were just doing their grocery shopping. I start freaking like right away, shouting at them to get out of Paulina before somebody shoots them. Other customers start noticing them now, and some telling me to calm down, some wondering what was going on. But I was sure to let them know about the tweet from the Tennessee Highway Patrol that I'd seen. I start shouting about how there are a pair of child predators in town looking for kids to lure into the woods to do God knows what to. Then it's just not me freaking out. Almost the whole store is flipping their lid and telling them they about to get run out of town if they don't get themselves out of there. You'd think they get scared with so many people shouting in their faces or whatever, but they didn't. They didn't move a muscle. They just stared back at everyone, and I remember one of them looking right at me. Didn't move. Didn't get worried or nothing. Just cocked his head at me like he was sizing me up. It was only when the store manager waved his phone at them, telling them that he was calling the cops, that they actually slowly turned around and walked out. Some of us tried to follow them out into the parking lot, but... They was just gone, like they straight up just disappeared. I think that was probably the freakiest thing to ever happen in my home state, or at least the only thing I can't really explain. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured in the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links down below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember... Drink mustard to cure cramps.